Good morning or good afternoon or good evening to everybody. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the NHGRI Machine Learning in Genomics Workshop. My name is Mark Craven. I'm on the faculty at the University of Wisconsin and I serve on the NHGRI Data Science Working Group and the NHGRI Council. And it is my honor to be co-chair of this workshop along with Trey Eidecker, although really it's the NHGRI staff who've done all the hard, hard work in organizing the workshop. So we have a, a truly stellar lineup of speakers and session moder moderators who are working at the forefront of machine learning and genomics. And in just a minute, we'll get to the program. But before we do that, I'd like to introduce and turn the floor over to my co-chair, Trey Eidecker. Hi, so as Mark said, I'm Trey Eidecker. I'm with Mark, the co-chair of this meeting. I am a uh, professor in the Division of Genetics in the Department of Medicine at UC San Diego. You'll be hearing a lot more from both Mark and me as the meeting goes on in the various sessions and then in the session wrap-ups at the end of every day. So I think with, with that and without further ado, it's my great honor to introduce our Institute Director, uh, uh, Director of the National Human Genome Research Institute, Dr. Eric Green, who will give some welcoming remarks. Well, thank you, Mark and Trey, uh, for your introductions and actually for your uh, remarkably valuable leadership and help in putting this workshop together. And I wanna welcome everyone to day one of NHGRI's Machine Learning and Genomics uh, Workshop. Now, for those of you who may be a little less familiar with NHGRI, the Institute is one of the 27 institutes and centers that makes up the US National Institutes of Health. Of course, the NIH is the world's largest funder of biomedical research. Now, as an institute, uh, we um, every once in a while put together uh, and publish strategic visions uh, that um, really help to guide the field of genomics. And our latest was published uh, late last year in 2020. We released our new strategic vision, which we think really details the most compelling areas to pursue in human genomics in the coming decade. Now, the strategic vision is organized into four major areas, guiding principles and values for human genomics, sustaining and improving a robust foundation for genomics, breaking down barriers that impede progress in genomics, and, and finally, compelling genomics research projects in biomedicine. Now, needless to say, artificial intelligence and machine learning came up multiple times uh, during our strategic planning process and really are identified in the strategic vision as areas that present tremendous opportunities for genomics. And by prioritizing novel statistical methods and considering aspects of machine learning that could be complementary to more traditional analyses of genomic data, it seems very likely that machine learning will become integral to the next breakthroughs that we expect in the coming decade in genomics. In another area of focus though, it's important to understand that we need to understand how machine learning is gonna be used and how it sort of fits into the context of important ethical, legal, and social implications of human genomics. And that will be another really important area to consider as we think about the productive use of genomics and the implementation of genomic medicine. If you wanna read more about our strategic vision, it can be found on NHGRI's website, uh, genome.gov. But it wasn't just NHGRI that does strategic planning in this area. At the NIH level, there has been increasing interest about artificial intelligence and machine learning. And back in March of 2019, the artificial intelligence working group that was established by the NIH director, Francis Collins, as part of his advisory committee to the director, they finalized their report, which detailed the potential role of artificial intelligence and machine learning in the future of biomedical research. And the report identified opportunities, challenges, and outcomes of implementing artificial intelligence and machine learning approaches across all the NIH institutes and centers and all of the areas of biomedicine that NIH is interested in. Now, the working group's final report concluded that the computational and biomedical communities are poised to jointly drive transformative progress in biomedical research, leading to new insights into how all living systems work and in care delivery leading to improvements in the health of all humans and all communities. And a specific recommendation of the working group worth highlighting is recommendation number A. The NIH should continue and expand support for engagement with wider artificial intelligence and machine learning communities 
This approach was piloted at the Neuro IPS in December of 2019 and should be expanded to other conferences and other opportunities for convening experts from different fields. Uh, and thus, this makes a lot of sense relative to this workshop. And so at this week's workshop, we hope to hear from different members of the artificial intelligence and machine learning fields to get a more complete picture of the opportunities and challenges that will guide future NHGRI directions in our area of interest, of course, that being genomics. Now, related to the recommendations of the Artificial Intelligence Working Group of the NIH Director's Advisory Committee, um, the NIH uh, recently um, issued uh, important um, funding opportunity announcements for something known as Bridge to Artificial Intelligence or Bridge to AI program. And the FOAs are listed here. And if you want to read more about this, I would send you specifically um, to this website um, that's listed here on this slide, which I'm sure you could also find by Googling. So for this workshop, what is our uh, intention? So in light of all these developments, both at the NHGRI level, at the NIH level, we have decided to spearhead efforts to push the boundaries of machine learning in genomics. Now we understand the value of engaging the community for this, as we always do, uh, which is the reasoning behind convening this workshop. And in fact, the initial feedback from the community was a guiding factor in shaping how we put this workshop together. Now, the major goals of the workshop are to stimulate discussion around the opportunities and obstacles underlying the application of machine learning methods to basic genomics and also genomic medicine. Also to define the key areas in genomics that would benefit from machine learning analyses, and also to identify and shape NHGRI's unique role at the convergence of genomic and machine learning research. The four sessions of the workshop will reflect broad topics of the machine learning field with ample time after presentations for questions and comments. And all the feedback from the question and answer sessions and post-meeting survey will be recorded and available um, for review subsequently. Now, workshops like this do not happen with uh, a lot of work from a lot of people. So I want to thank, uh, starting with the co-chairs, uh, Mark and Trey, but also the other members of the Genomic Data Science Working Group of the National Advisory Council for Human Genome Research for their support and planning and also moderating this workshop. For those unfamiliar with this working group, it was created as a subcommittee of NHGRI's Advisory Council to provide ongoing guidance related to data science as it relates to genomics and NHGRI programs. I would, of course, also like to thank the NHGRI Organizing Committee, as well as two very critical components of the Institute, our Information Technology Branch and our Communications and Public uh, Liaison Branch for their hard work in all of the IT uh, communication and other log logistical aspects of putting a workshop like this uh, together. And finally, of course, I want to thank uh, the speakers uh, listed here for presenting their research throughout the workshop and making themselves available for questions and feedback from the audience. This could not come together without the generosity of your expertise and knowledge and willingness to join us uh, throughout the next two days. And lastly, of course, I want to thank all of you for joining us today and tomorrow. The interest in this topic turned out to be, well, probably the best way to describe it would be huge. Um, I can tell you that as of Friday, there were over 3,400 people from 73 countries who registered for this event. Overall, this workshop then promises to be highly influential in guiding the field of machine learning and in genomics. And I really do look forward to the next uh, two days um, as we see this unfold. And so with that in mind, I'm going to hand uh, the, the session and the screen over to Dr. Shannon McWheeney, who's going to start uh, the keynote session. Thank you very much for joining us, and I look forward to spending time with you over the next two days. Hi, I'm Shannon McQueeny. I am uh, a member of the Genomic Data Science Working Group. I'm also a professor and division head uh, at Oregon Health and Science University in Portland, Oregon. And it is my honor to be the moderator today for the keynote session. Um, starting off, we have Eric Topol. He is the director and founder of the Scripps Research Translational Institute and the Gary and Mary West Endowed Chair of Innovative Medicine at Scripps Research. Well, thanks for having me in this machine learning and genomics workshop. Uh, I'm pleased to join and discuss how genomics is really moving forward uh, with AI. 
First to point out, of course, that as you know, we've hit the 20 year mark uh, for human genome sequencing. And what that's done, this incredible milestone, has led to extraordinary amounts of data. And this is really interesting because we've gone past yada bytes. And the question is how many uh, data sets that are gonna start to exceed levels that we had never anticipated with genomics being uh, a part of that. So it's been uh, postulated that we should start re renaming a new unit of hell of a bytes to exceed the level of data that we have today. So how are we gonna deal with all this massive data? Uh, some of which of course is through not just DNA sequences, but all the different layers of biology. And that makes us turn to neural networks. And so the neural networks, these deep neural networks, uh, although they've been compared with the brain, they really are not uh, all that similar. They're basically using uh, layers, really hidden layers of artificial neurons to process the data of inputs, which can be of massive scale, and to come out uh, with a proportional level of layers to get outputs of interpretation. And genomics is just one of the many areas in life science that's going through an AI revolution. And that's, of course, the focus uh, of the workshop. But also to give a point, this is very uh, early uh, in time point. It's only in 2015, not even six years ago, when we first started to see these convolutional networks for genomics like deep sea and deep bind. And already now we've seen just uh, in recent days the emergence of a dedicated institute at the Broad Institute, the Schmidt Center, which has a bunch of partners as uh, shown here. And it's basically taking into account that this has now a, uh, been a field that's developed where the data is massive and we need AI tools to process it and extract all the valuable information and knowledge. So first, let me point out that most of AI in medicine so far has been with images, that is like this chest X-ray, a scan. And that's a whole lot easier for AI interpretation than a DNA sequence. The reason being is that the pixels in a scan have only limited interaction with their neighboring pixels. Whereas in a genome, there is 3D relationships that can be long range. And so the ability to interpret a genome accurately is a far more challenging uh, task. But we have seen imaging being used for AI and genomics. And a great example of that is uh, this uh, using children. Uh, this is the uh, ability of Deep Gestalt, a uh, deep learning algorithm developed in Israel, whereby a smartphone picture, which has been trained in um, hundreds of thousands of images to accurately uh, make the diagnosis, at least tentative diagnosis, of the uh, chromosomal uh, genetic abnormality. It has over 90% accuracy, and the number of syndromes it can yield accurate diagnosis keeps increasing. So we have seen some image interpretation used in uh, genetics and genomics. But what we're really talking about today is the actual uh, data, biologic data, whether it be DNA or RNA or methylation, or 3D uh, transcription binding sites, all these things and applied in specific uh, instances like tumor and, or cancer, being able to distinguish the regulatory genome, uh, the functional genomics have been approaches of deep learning uh, in genomics today. And there are generally four different classes of neural networks. The, the most straightforward one is just classification, a fully connected or feed forward. Most of what we're talking about is convolutional for DNA sequence, but some using time are uh, recurrent neural networks. Uh, and then there are graph convolutional. So these different neural networks that are used in genomics are example here. This is uh, to determine a single transcription binding factor, but it can be multitask for two transcription factors. And then it can be integrated with DNA sequence and chromatin accessibility. And this is a really good review article that even though it's almost two years old uh, in Nature Review Genetics, I, I certainly would recommend it to you. And in that same review, 
there's you know, the idea of uh, haplotypes, and this extends that. This is just um, the work uh, done uh, in just a, a couple of weeks ago, uh, whereby uh, a haplotype for variant calling was using uh, a Bayesian model. This is so-called octopus, uh, getting much higher sensitivity and specificity than prior variant callers. And this is one of the big issues when we uh, have genomic data is being able to call what is a variant and what isn't. And uh, this uh, is the output of octopus compared to its predecessors like deep variant or GATK and others. And uh, consistently uh, octopus uh, outperformed. So that's just to show you how we continue to eke out improvements, iterative improvements with these different deep learning uh, algorithmic efforts. Now, another uh, part of DNA sequencing is the ability uh, to uh, predict these variants. And here you see amber uh, and how it predicts a bit better than the original one, deep C and deep bind and the heritability enrichment. So this again is another recent paper, again, exemplifying this staged improvement uh, in able to uh, predict variants. There's also uh, many other aspects that we see uh, uh, continued jumps uh, in the use of deep learning. Here is an example of uh, differential gene expression. And uh, this was seen across uh, all the different tissues in the body. But we also have seen it uh, for predicting transcription factor binding. And this is agent bind. A lot of these algorithms have deep as their first part of their uh, name, but here we're starting to see a little more creative uh, names like agent bind. And this is for splice uh, prediction from the sequence through a deep learning algorithm published uh, a couple of years back in, in cell. There's also the ability to distinguish uh, rare variants uh, for undiagnosed diseases uh, that was um, published last year in uh, genetics and medicine. Now, one of the areas where genomics uh, is becoming more uh, used in the medical space is in cancer and understanding, deconstructing the genomics of a person's cancer. And what's striking here is more reliance on the liquid biopsy, that is uh, cell-free tumor DNA, self, uh, plasma DNA that is from tumor, which now through deep learning algorithms can be analyzed to determine what is the primary uh, source of the cancer, which previously it was yes, no, there's cancer. Now the ability to take this approach to understand uh, its source. And that's a step in the right direction. And we're increasingly seeing liquid biopsy used in cancer. This is a welcome uh, uh, sign of progress. Also, the ability to pick up the mutations. This is an example in prostate cancer. Uh, here, uh, the standard method uh, uh, on one side, and then on the other is the deep learning and picking up far more variants, as you see, compared uh, uh, in the deep learning. So our ability to extract the rele relevant information through deep learning in cancer has certainly been enhanced. But also unexpectedly, our potential ability to predict the evolution of the cancer. So when you know a particular variants that are present in a, a tumor sample, you could actually predict when and what variants will be appearing over time. And this is just the beginning of that work. Uh, it's an exciting direction. Unfortunately, like so many other things that happen in the reports, it gets somewhat exaggerated. And here is the UK coverage of that robot war on cancer. AI predicts tumor growth. Well, that's, of course, a little bit of hyperbole. Now, on the cover of the New York Times Magazine at the end of March was a SARS-CoV-2 virus sequence, which has about 30,000 bases. And it's bringing it into the mainstream. And we haven't paid enough attention to pathogen sequencing. We've been thinking and talking uh, so far about uh, whole uh, human genome sequencing. But what's interesting is, again, just like that prediction of cancer, where it's headed in a particular patient, the idea that we could predict uh, a strain of influenza or where is uh, SARS-CoV-2 going by learning the language of the virus. And this was published earlier this year in Science 
for influenza being the rich data set we have and one that's developing right now, of course, is for COVID. Now, another tool that we have uh, before getting into some examples of how they can be used is transfer learning or meta learning. That is taking in this New Yorker article, a very uh, interesting uh, piece that uh, the use of uh, a deep learning, a deep neural network for interpreting what type of pastry that ultimately was used in transfer learning to understand um, uh, cancer. And also we have seen this meta learning that is learning from learning being applied to genomics like single cell sequencing or adult uh, cancer genome atlas now uh, to pediatric uh, genomics. And this is just an example of transfer learning in single cell RNA-seq, which are big data sets that can be hard to interpret and, and putting them through a transfer learning approach. Now, the idea also, of course, is that we could analyze samples from large numbers of individuals and integrate that in the immunome. And here is from 11 million T cells from 40 patients controlling for things like batch effects and sample preps. And this is yet another example of what you can do uh, with a deep multitasking uh, neural network. And of course, there's ability to analyze um, uh, gene regulation and uh, understand epigenetic regulation as was published uh, just in March in Nature Computational Science. Now, CRISPR obviously is the biggest breakthrough in life science of our era, of our time. And the idea that we could use AI to guide CRISPR uh, is now been firmed up through many different studies. This was from the Microsoft uh, group uh, to, the, that using AI to predict off-target effects of CRISPR uh, guide RNAs. And then there's a series of articles that I've just highlighted here of AI CRISPR editing uh, here you see um, whether it's in T cells uh, or wh whether it's uh, with um, deep learning with network-based gene features uh, for guiding RNA uh, for gene therapy. So not only has AI helped with CRISPR uh, predicting offsite and predicting the right guides, but also in coming up with the best uh, approach for gene therapy. I just want to point out that sequencing is getting more complex. Now we're seeing in situ sequencing, which is going to increasingly generate massive data sets. Again, why we need deep learning tools uh, to interpret these uh, data. And just for uh, those who are uh, intimidated by equations, this is an article that talks about multi-omics. And this is a problem we have, is integrating multiple layers of different omics, like uh, the the uh, genome sequence, single cell RNA, epigenome, proteome, uh, and, and these different layers. And uh, this is a complex uh, task that is yet to be fully actualized. Now, one type of AI nearest neighbor analysis deserves mention because this is the idea that we could have digital twins uh, from a massive resource uh, uh, infrastructure. And uh, uh, this is something that is really coming into play now uh, because if Tempest, which is a uh, company based in Chicago that's uh, largely been uh, cancer dedicated, uh, I'm an advisor for that company. Uh, it has generated massive amount of data in cancer. Now with 200,000 patients uh, sequencing uh, tumor and um, multi-omic uh, data, along with electronic health record, treatment outcomes, pathology and, uh, and uh, scans, relevant scans were digitized, and even more, they don't have full data set. And the idea here is that we could do neighbor, nearest neighbor analysis and find individuals at the time of one person being diagnosed, uh, match as closely as possible to then be able to predict uh, treatment and outcomes. So this is, instead of clinical trials, which often have only a small percent of patients uh, that are relevant for the patient in, uh, uh, presenting in question, now we would have very precise potential matching. This has to be validated. It has not yet been to date, but it's a rich resource and cancer is just the beginning of where this can go. Now I wanna go through two projects to close that are real world, 
projects uh, that um, exemplify some of the issues. One at Scripps Research is our uh, quest to take sparse data, namely the data that is found uh, in arrays such as Affymetrics or Axiom with four to five million variants, and to then be able to predict the 80 million genetic variants. Uh, and so this is a task that has not yet been accomplished that we've taken on, and it's a very challenging one. And uh, Raquel Diaz in our group uh, is a KL2 scholar in our CTSA program, and along with Ali Torquemani has been leading this effort, starting on 9P21, which is uh, the um, region uh, of the genome, which is ex extensively um, regulatory enhancer rich. So it's a very complex area. Then currently moving on to chromosome 22, which has about a thousand very complex regions and not yet, and you'll see why, to the level of the whole genome. And the whole idea is using unsupervised learning. So rather than uh, the uh, types of AI like uh, uh, hidden uh, Markov model or Bayesian, or even just regular supervised learning with deep uh, neural networks, the idea is to use an autoencoder, which works through a bottleneck to get data out, um, and uh, also GANs, or generative adversarial networks, that were really originated with Ian Goodfellow, here being shown about uh, 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 real or synthetic data from genomics. Well, we have taken the approach of using an autoencoder, but not just any autoencoder, uh, what's called a denoising autoencoder for this imputation project at Scripps. And so what that denoising uh, accounts for is the ability to deal with missing data. That's where the X's show on the input. And everything is about the inputs. If you're going to go through this uh, autoencoder and impute the right um, uh, variant at a much uh, level of granularity or depth. So here is comparing what has been the accepted standard, which uses a hidden Markov model, so-called Minimac, compare with our denoising autoencoder. And what you can see surprisingly, it didn't do very well, it underperformed. And in fact, it was something like 79% versus 21% for having uh, the correlation. Uh, and so we said, well, why is that happening? Why is our, what should have been this great deep neural network denoising autoencoder not working as well as a more primitive form of AI. And what it turned out was all related to the inputs, as you might have suspected. And when we adjusted the inputs using 30,000 virtual babies, the synthetic data with far better admixture, that is uh, uh, ability to generate a much bigger data set with much more diversity, well, then we had a, a far, this genomic data augmentation gave us the ability to simulate the minimap. And that is important because an autoencoder like this can move at a much faster speed, much less computing time, and it can be continued to be tweaked to be uh, far better. So this then gives us a double benefit, not just to deal with the imputation, but also to then apply that to things like polygenic risk prediction and multitask deep learning, which is the end goal of this initiative. And you can see here the advantage of the autoencoder that we use versus Minimac, the runtime and the accuracy while getting a equivalent accuracy, how much uh, the time reduced uh, to process this data. So it's really an exciting advance because the more genomic data we have, the more we can use these um, unsupervised learning tools uh, of deep neural networks. But to point out, this is a graphic pr uh, processing unit GPU guzzler. Uh, we're using uh, four models per GPU running 18 GPUs for this project of chromosome 22. Each model takes three to five days to train. And to extrapolate that for a whole genome, we'd need 500,000 GPUs. So that's why we haven't gotten there yet. We're just getting a chromosome 22 nailed down. So the point being here is to get not for the end user once the validation is done, but to get this imputation work accomplished, it takes a lot of uh, computing power. And this is what the A100 current state-of-the-art GPU from NVIDIA looks like. 
And this is how much it costs. These are the specs. And this is over $13,000. So putting a whole bunch of those in your cart would really add up very quickly, especially if you're trying to do a whole genome. Now, that's one project. The other one I wanted to highlight is with our partner, Rady Children's Hospital, the largest uh, and really the Children's Hospital Pediatric Center of San Diego County, which has three and a half million people centralized in this one facility. And Stephen Kingsmore and his group working with us in our CTSA has developed the program in the world uh, for rapid uh, genomic interpretation, uh, acquisition and interpretation and management change uh, for sick ne neonates, not just newborns, but also even in uh, children. So this uh, typically is in a neonate. And uh, what's fascinating here is uh, of course, every minute counts because if a diagnosis isn't made quickly, it could lead to uh, brain damage. It could lead to the death of the uh, newborn. So that's why time is, is essential. And now this uh, group has been able to take from sample from a critically ill infant to management of that infant in 13 and a half hours. And uh, this is using multiple different AI tools. And it, to me, is the best example of AI in medicine today, which is interesting because it upends the usual story of it starting in adults and only eventually getting into pediatric. This is just the opposite. So the steps are, number one, taking the structured and unstructured data from the medical record, from the electronic health record. That takes less than a minute, actually 20 seconds. And then it's the variant uh, calling, which is happening concurrently that takes uh, a, a bunch of hours and the automated diagnosis and eventually the automated management. And this all can be done in a time a frame of just over 13 hours. So just to take you through the steps, uh, Rady is using ClinyThink uh, or Clamp more recently to do this clinical natural language processing, which is working also at the unstructured level of data in the electronic health record to pick up all the relevant terms. Then there's the automated interpretation, and this is using two different tools, uh, Fabric Genomics Gem and Invitae's Moon, which prioritize and ranks the variants and gives a score. As it gets that score over one and a half, it gets to you know very high uh, likelihood of being an accurate diagnosis. And then the third step is this genome to treatment management. Uh, this is a home-baked uh, effort at Rady that incorporates multiple different AI uh, algorithms, Alexion, which uh, has uh, the data from all the literature, as well as uh, Rancho uh, Biosciences, uh, taking the compilation of all the resources and then coming up with a management for the uh, neonatologist or pediatrician on how to manage the condition uh, that's been diagnosed. This is really extraordinary. A whole bunch of different uh, deep neural networks to get the answer to manage a sick neonate. And that takes me to the end, which is uh, we think in genomics too much uh, genome centric. We want to see as much integration with other layers of biologic data, the electronic health record, the environment as possible. And so eventually we will get to this point with genomics being a fundamental layer of a multi-dimensional effort of real-time processing of a person's data, be it for a virtual medical assistant or for a clinician caring for a patient. We aren't there, deep learning is not enough, hybrid models will be required, but eventually this is something that is an exciting frontier in the years ahead. So with that, let me thank all my colleagues at our institute, uh, SRTI within Scripps, Scripps Research, with whom I have the real pleasure to work with on a day-to-day -day basis and all the different uh, funding uh, uh, support that we have uh, from NIH, uh, from NHGRI, and from all of us. And I look forward very much to your questions and uh, our interaction. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, that was fantastic. Our next, and uh, just as a reminder, we will be taking the questions at the end for both of our keynote speakers. Uh, our next keynote is Bradley Mallon, who is the Accenture Professor of Biomedical Informatics, Biostatistics, and Computer Science, as well as the Director of the Health Information Privacy Laboratory at Vanderbilt University. 
Good morning. I'm Brad Mallon from Vanderbilt University and Vanderbilt University Medical Center. And I'm speaking with you this morning about various challenges and opportunities for machine learning and genomics. So let's jump in. One of the first things that we need to talk about is that it's a process. The entire learning process is facilitated by the data that we collect. And this data comes from a variety of institutions, individuals, and organizations all around the world. And once you collect all the data, we're going to be pushing it through some type of a magic box. And I don't think that everybody completely understands all of the frameworks that machine learning facilitates. But at the end of the day, what it's doing is learning over the information to try to generate a model and give you a relationship between all of the different facets of individuals that have been fed into the system, whether it be about the genes, whether it be about the single nucleotide polymorphisms, or just general variants. However, the process is not one way. Once you get a model, you need to go back and figure out, was this actually a good model? Did the system learn in a manner that provided me with intuition that supported the biology that we're aware of already, or provided intuition that gave us new direction to proceed with that we weren't aware of before, but it still makes sense. Now, if it doesn't, we go back, we check to see if the model is any better. However, it may also be the situation where we don't have the right data. And if you don't have the right data, now you need to go off and augment the system as it's been designed. And what that means is trying to collect additional variables about individuals, but also possibly about trying to collect new data about people that you haven't seen yet. So there's four different topics that I wanna to cover today. We're gonna to dig into them, but I'll leave a lot of time at the end so that we can have more of a discussion during the Q&A. So the first topic that I wanna discuss is that bigger is not always better, but it can be. So I call this the safety in numbers problem. First, I think everybody recognizes the process that I just explained a moment ago. But when you have a single site that's actually performing machine learning, at the end of the day, they wanna know, did what I see actually make sense at other institutions? So it makes sense for an institution to say, hey, what is everybody else seeing? And it might be that I don't have sufficient information in order to verify that what I saw was statistically significant. So I wanna go check and see what others have. So there's a number of other organizations that are going to be collecting information. And we realize that there's a lot of barriers to sharing this information, but we have various networks that have been established to facilitate this process. Now, when you do this and you check to see if what you have replicates in other institutions or with other people's data, then this is about robustness. This is about ensuring that everything that you have is either replicable or generalizable to a certain degree. Now, this is not easy to accomplish. We've had several consortia that have pulled this off, but we're moving in this direction. But to really do this in a meaningful way, we're not gonna have to just replicate what we've come across. We need to broaden the data. And what this entails is typically we're dealing with the DNA of an individual. And everybody's recognized that there are other resources that need to be brought to the table in order to facilitate deeper investigations. Now, this could include the socioeconomic status of the individuals to whom the data corresponds. It could be information that comes out of their medical records. And for the last 15 years, we've been doing this within the electronic medical records and genomics network that NHGRI has been sponsoring. But it also might be about taking clinical trials that have been performed and expanding them with real world evidence. Regardless, this is about linking all of this together. Now, these are only a couple of resources that I've shown you. There are a number of others that could vary in the amount of information that we have and the comfort level that people have in providing them. And these are the non-traditional pieces of information, everything that includes an individual's over-the-counter or retail purchases, possibly at a pharmacy or at a grocery store, what they're doing in a social environment, whether that be through social media or just general social interactions in terms of who they're uh, hanging out with or where people are receiving influence from. 
It could be about how much energy they have or what they're doing on a daily basis in terms of moving their body around. That could come from fitness records, such as an Apple Watch or a, a, a Fitbit. And then it could also be about lifestyle decisions, things that we ask people or just generally observe, such as how much alcohol do they consume? Do they smoke? In general. Now, this is one little piece of the puzzle still, because this is about what one person who might be a parent, for instance, has actually done and has been documented. But we don't just wanna look at one person. We wanna look at the relationship between individuals. And so we wanna look at either mom-baby pairs or father-child pairs, and not just a single child. We, act, we want the entire genealogy or the pedigree, and then track and integrate all this information to facilitate the type of investigation that is not just a one-off. Now, I think everybody recognizes that over the past several years, it's become clear that the going broader perspective is not really sufficient to provide society with the type of insight that we need when we're performing any type of learning with this type of data. And the notion of bias has crept in. Now, what exactly does this mean? Um, this is an example of information that uh, Steph Devaney from the All of Us program put in the paper a couple years ago. And what you can see here on the left is the number of people who fit a certain racial profile that have had their information used in uh, gene association studies. And what you can see is that it's on the order of close to 80% where it's Caucasian background, uh, European ancestry that have had their information used. Now, it's a little better in terms of the bias when you move over towards what studies have been done. So as you can see, even though we have 80% approximately of white individuals in the resource uh, or resources, that the total number of studies in which they've been used is only around 50%. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that these studies are all equal. This is just a count of the number of studies that have been performed. And some of them are of a larger scale than others. Regardless, it's still clear that there's a bias with respect to when information is being used and studied. Now, the implications for this have been non-trivial because when you learn models, such as in, in this situation, there were models that were learned for 17 uh, qualitative trait loci. When you make these types of, when you make predictions based on this information, it's pretty clear that the generalizability of the models really falls to the wayside as you shift away from the population from which the model was based. And so if the model was based on European individuals and the predictions are made on European individuals, then the variance associated with its predictive capability remains pretty small. And so the point estimate that you had in the initial studies holds true. However, as you start shifting towards other populations, such as going towards Southeast Asians, East Asians, and African populations in particular, or populations of African American heritage, uh, the, the predictive capability drops to a point where it could be, it could be as good as what you saw, but it could be almost 75% worse than what you expect it to be. It's a, it, it's a known phenomenon. It's just that this happens in genomics uh, at a scale that we, we really haven't seen simply because of the number of variables that come into these models. Um, this, was, this was known, for instance, um, at, at least 30 years ago when the Framingham Park study data was used for facilitation of um, uh, the design of heart attack risk or cardiovascular risk. Um, but we're now seeing this on, a, on a, an even larger scale. So there has been some movement to try and change the situation. And I'll highlight that in the All of Us program, which, which I have a relationship with, this was a, a notion that was really taken to heart from the beginning of the study. And it's, a, it's about really enhancing the resources that we have to not just include people who have 
typically been involved within uh, biomedical research, but broadening this towards underrepresented groups. Um, as, of, as of about a year ago, uh, with the quarter million people whose, whose uh, specimens and data that we had collected, um, we had deliberately selected for populations that were not just white in nature. And so over 22, 20% of, of the population that, that we had established uh, or collected information on was, was of, of Black or African-American uh, descent uh, and around 17% were of, of Hispanic background. Um, now, this doesn't necessarily mean that, that we have completely changed the problem or fixed the problem. What, what I'm showing is that you need to be deliberate about changing your perspective and creating data sets that are going to lead to greater equity in the research enterprise. At the same time, I said bigger is better, and you probably were thinking about data. But in reality, it's the entire process. And that process includes the people who are performing the investigations. Because when you're going about learning models and just performing learning in general, people make conscious decisions about what models need to be used, as well as what is the pre-existing knowledge that we bring to the table. And that knowledge is dependent upon the people who are actually performing the investigations. So you need to broaden the population that are actually performing these investigations. Now, this has been recognized by NHGRI and the NIH in general, but simply broadening the set of investigators who are at the table is one thing. You need to be able to broaden that population with a skill set that can actually do the types of analytics that we're talking about. Otherwise, you'll have scientists that are sitting at the table saying, you know, we should do studies in X, but they really want to understand how exactly you do that study. Okay, so this is, this is the first challenge that I believe is going to help drive where we go over the next five to 10 years. The second one I want to talk about is about cost effectiveness when we're performing machine learning. One thing that I hear over and over again is that we're going to move to the cloud. And we've been moving to the cloud for at least five to 10 years. And the cloud is wonderful. It provides dynamic compute and elastic compute capabilities. But at the same time, there's a cost associated with this. And, there's, and I'm not talking about hidden costs. I'm talking about explicit, you put your money on the table type of costs. So the process that I described below was or earlier was really just a small summary of what's going on with the scientific enterprise, where you take data forward, you push it into your machine learning framework, whatever it may be. But then in the cloud environment, you're going to pay for every analyst analysis that you're going to run. So you pay a little bit, or you give a little bit of money to your graduate students, and they pay a little bit, and they run their study. And out comes junk, absolute junk. This is fully expected the first time around. You either didn't tune your parameters correctly, or the data wasn't loaded correctly. Whatever it was, the money is spent, and junk has been generated. So what do you do? Next step? You wipe that data, you give your graduate student another hundred bucks, and they run the study again. And out comes, eh, it's something that's a little better. You know, it's still a little junky. And you look at it and you say, well, you know, it's heading in the right direction, but let's rerun the study again. And you do this over and over and over. And this is a normal scientific process. But unfortunately, in the context of the cloud, you're in a situation where you are constantly paying for a compute. And so after you've done this on the order of a thousand times and spend a million dollars, then you get to the point where you go, aha, I think I've got an interesting paper. This is not effective. This is not scalable. This is not supportable. In order to make this better, we need to create algorithms that make sense of data with a smaller model, or figure out how to more cost-effectively run lots of models simultaneously so that we can sift through how we're actually generating the data, how we're actually generating our findings to direct workflows in a manner that makes it much less likely that we're going to spend our entire budget 
simply to try and sift through how best to use the online cloud computing environments that have been established. So the third point that I'd like to talk about today has to do with data sharing and making data more widely accessible. Now, before I do, I'd like to begin with a cautionary tale. And in this tale, we are in an environment where people have begun sharing their genomic information into the public setting. And this is an artifact of the direct-to-consumer genomics revolution. One of the ways in which people have decided to take genomics into their own hand to facilitate learning is making their data accessible in websites where they get to discover relationships with other kin. Um, now, this sounds like a great idea. It facilitates discovery, but at the same time, it can lead to unintended consequences. One of those consequences is typified by the way that law enforcement has begun to use these resources as well. And the example that I offer to you is the case of Joseph D'Angelo, who is the Golden State Killer. The long story short is that this was a serial killer who in the 1970s uh, um, committed a number of crimes in, in California. And when the case went cold, uh, they lost the ability to discover him. However, the FBI did have DNA from the scene. And at a future point in time, actually several years ago, they were able to go to sites like GED Match, where they could put his genomic record into there and then discover who his relatives were. And they were able to find his third or fourth cousin and then build a pedigree and figure out, you know, where is the individual that does not show up uh, in the modern day uh, society. And eventually the family members led them back to uh, this individual who was in the state of California. And once they took his DNA, they were able to figure out um, that this is the individual that they've been looking for. This sounds like a great opportunity for law enforcement and yet it turns into a bit of a concern for the rest of society. Um, GED match um, uh, you know, is not just a single one-off. Uh, it turns out that this type of a problem for Caucasians in the United States leads to uh, uh, information of uh, a third or fourth cousin on around somewhere between 50 to 80% of the population. So if we have concerns with making information public, then one of the ways in which we might be able to solve this problem is to make the information accessible to only the algorithms themselves and learn over data um, behind closed doors. And so one of the ways in which this can be done is through the notion of secure multi-party computation. And in, in SMC, what happens is that you encrypt all the information and then you compute over the information to generate aggregated results without ever revealing what any particular record corresponded to. This sounds like a great idea, except in order to make this really work in practice, there's several things that we need to do. First, we need to have software that facilitates the rapid reconfiguration of any computable model so that we can evolve it with respect to statistical techniques as they change. Secondly, we need to be able to take advantage of the fact that some of these computations are best done in a software system, some of them are best done on hardware. However, it's probably gonna be a combination of the two and figuring out how to optimize that is gonna require further investigation. Third, people are gonna be using data, but they're not necessarily going to be telling you what they're actually using it for. And so this creates concerns about accountability. Now, one of the ways in which we might be able to address the accountability problem is through distributed ledgers. I'm not necessarily a large advocate for blockchain technology, but it might actually serve as the basis of what we're looking to support in the future. And finally, if we're going to create an environment where we allow people to compute over data that they can't see, we need to make sure that they're comfortable with that. A lot of scientists like to be able to scratch and sniff and make sure that the data is what they think it is. But once you take that out of their hands, there's gonna be lots of questions over how trustworthy is this setting. So another way in which information is going to be, or there are expectations information can be shared is that we move from sharing real data to providing synthetic data out into the world. 
And instead of allowing people to uh, perform direct hypothesis tests, we allow them to perform hypothesis generation to determine if it's even worthy of moving forward with uh, deeper analyses. Now, we've, we've been conducting research on the notion of, of synthetic data for, for a couple of years now, um, where we really cut our teeth on using deep learning frameworks to simulate electronic medical records data. Um, and the, the framework associated with this is, is through what you call adversarial learning, um, but the details of this I'll, I'll leave to another time. What I will il illustrate is that it, it does have the ability to scale up towards high dimensional environments. And what you're seeing here is, is an illustration of the correlation of the rates at which diagnosis codes um, for individuals show up in two random samples of electronic medical records. And what you're seeing here on the y-axis is the rate at which this information shows up in the synthetic data that we end up generating. You can see visually that these systems are not exactly the same, but they're moving in the right direction. Um, in terms of translating this into genomic data, fortunately, just about a month ago, there was research to illustrate that it appears to be a, a feasible application as well. But we're really at the beginning of the innovation curve. So the last point that I want to bring up has to do with the movement of machine learning from research into its application and the notion of decision support. We're moving into a world of genomic medicine, but in order to do that, we're going to need to take into account the fact that there are hundreds to thousands of variables that are being used to create these technologies. Um, the Food and Drug Administration has recognized that these types of machine learning or artificial intelligence driven technologies are going to be useful. And they've already provided approval for over a hundred different technologies. And this has really picked up over the last two years. But if you're gonna go in this direction, several things you need to keep in mind. As I already alluded to, these are going to be large frameworks. There's going to be thousands of variables and lots of things can go wrong. We need that system to be verifiable. We need to know that the right model was used at the right time and who used it. And so in that respect, they must be auditable. We know that these systems are going to evolve over time. So we need to know which one was used when. And they must be explainable. We need to have the ability to tell people that this is the reason why this technology was used. And building trust is going to require having the ability to relate what the technology is doing into some understanding of the real world. And as I alluded to, these are going to need to be equitable. So several parting thoughts. One, we do need big data, but this data cannot just be deep. It needs to be diverse. Secondly, we need systems to be cost-effective. We can't be spending millions of dollars just for computation. Third, we need to have trust in this environment. We need people to feel comfortable with just providing the learning or the results of the learning over the data instead of actually seeing the data itself. And then finally, we need to have explainability. We need to ensure that the way in which our system is making recommendations for action are actually in association with how the world works. So I thank NHGRI for their invitation. I thank you for listening to this presentation. And I thank the All of Us program and the Electronic Medical Records and Genomics Network for providing proving ground for some of these technologies as we begin to move forward. So we're going to begin the Q&A. Um, you have the ability to ask uh, questions of either of the keynote or for both of the keynote speakers um, using the Q&A polling uh, session. Uh, only the Zoom participants can do this. Um, and we already have a couple of questions that have come in. Um, the first one is for Dr. Topol. Um, this was about the um, really beautiful example you showed at the end, the collaboration between Scripps and Rady Children's. Um, and the question was, how can that be distributed to other cities or uh, centers? Um, the person who's asking this had a, a, a child who was offered this at the NICU in, in another hospital, but the experience was that they'd have to wait. There would have been a long delay and they had to make a decision 
uh, right away. Um, and so getting samples from Spokane to Rady would have been a bottleneck in that case. Are there any thoughts or ideas on solving the challenge of getting this distributed to other centers? And then what are the challenges in broadly distributing a pipeline like this one? Well, thanks, Shannon. It's great to be with you and Brad on this session. Um, I do think the example with Rady is perhaps the most advanced uh, use of AI in medicine today. And it upends the model where everything starts with adults and moves into kids. This is just the opposite. Now, uh, what uh, Stephen Kingsmore and the group is doing um, is trying to spread that throughout the country. So there are now uh, multi, multiple um, sites that are basically are using the same tools, the same kind of uh, flow uh, of uh, how to extract the data and get to the management side. So the hope is in the short term, all these refinements that are, you know, it's constantly being tweaked will be universally available, you know, not just in the US, but broadly. It's interesting because, you know, just a couple of years ago, this was um, more than a, a 24, 36 hour story. And it wasn't to management, it was just to make a diagnosis. It's just getting so much better. But as the questioner brings up, diffusion of this is equally as important. Uh, we've seen enough validation that it really helps these sick babies and children. Now we've got to get it to become the standard of care. Fantastic, thank you. Um, the next question is for uh, Dr. Mallon. Uh, this for, is in regards to cloud computing. Um, and one of the questions is around trust. Um, so this is coming from the perspective of a medical institution being able to, tr to trust a private site um, in, tr in terms of thinking about things like data leaks that have happened and continue to happen, are there other alternatives or are there other ways that we could think to mitigate this? I think it's a fair question. Um, one of the things I always encourage people to think about when they're trying to decide whether or not to move operations into the cloud is, are, are, is it more secure than what you're currently doing? Um, you know, in, in many ways, what we're currently doing by managing our own servers locally um, is not necessarily any more secure than actually moving data out into the cloud where you have teams that are constantly dedicated towards applying the, the most up-to-date patches and the best security practices. Um, does that mean that breaches won't happen? No, I, I still think that it comes down to best practice with respect to um, you know, encrypting data when it's at risk. Um, making sure that the access and authentication protocols are correct. Um, but, you know, there's also questions about, you know, this question about trust is that has to do with agreements more than anything else in terms of what the cloud service provider is allowed to do with the information that's been uploaded into their resource. Um, you know, most of the time people are using AWS, for instance, it's, it's local private, it, it's virtual private machines. So Amazon doesn't really have access to the information itself. It's really you just using their platform as a service. Um, and so in, in that respect, there's, there's a lot of control that, that you end up having. Um, but as I said, it, you know, no system is completely secure. It's really just a matter of where you think it's gonna be best allocated in terms of your, uh, uh, your energy, of, in terms of management. Great, thank you so much. Um, this question really could be to either one of you. Um, the questioner asked, what do you do the role of medical geneticists and the, so physicians trained in residency for medical genetics in the continued adoption of machine learning applications in genomics? I'll take a shot at this maybe and I'm interested to get Brad's perspective too. Um, one of the things that people think about AI is that it's gonna replace uh, expertise, human expertise, and that couldn't be further from the truth. And that extends to, you know, whether it's radiologists, pathologists, and medical geneticists. The human in the loop thing is so important. That's why, you know, the whole idea that we were just talking about with respect to the sick children and neonates, you got to have uh, an expert overseeing this because there are glitches. There, there, you know, the, these algorithms, no matter how good they get, are always going to have imperfections and human judgment especially by people with expertise is so critical. We're talking about, you know, not just important, but potentially life or death decisions here. So we, we need medical geneticists. We need a lot more of them actually. And what we're talking about now is just having this leaning on machines to deal with the data and then the oversight, uh, which is the fusion of this, which is the best possible scenario. 
I, I think Eric hit it right on the head, <laughs> to be honest with you. I mean, the, the notion that machine learning is going to sub be a substitute for human intuition, um, it's not going to be the case all the time. There are some places where I think you will see it with, with a very clear application. I think, I think image interpretation, for instance, like radiological services, where we're already seeing that systems can do as well, if not better than humans. But you, you do run into these problems where um, you know, what this does is, is that it frees up opportunity, it frees up time for humans to actually reason about the more difficult challenges. And so you're gonna have computers that can do things 80, 90, maybe even 95% of the time, but you're still gonna need humans that look at, at problems that are not actually being addressed by the machine learning or whatever type of artificial intelligence you've used. So you don't stop training people in, in specific areas. If anything, what you have to do is supplement their training to recognize that while the machines are going to provide some services to them, it's not going to provide all services. Um, and it's, in, in many respects, it's an evolution of a field. You know, this is, it's not the case that, that physicians are actually doing bench-based pathology work in order to facilitate their patients, right? This is, this is something that they send things out to the lab, the path doctors or the pathologists are doing what they're supposed to do. And then the information comes back and it's up to the clinician at that time to decide whether or not they trust what exactly it is that has been put in front of them and what to do next. No matter what, it's it, usually what happens, well, not no matter what, but usually what will happen with machine learning is that you're not going to just get a single best response. In a complex environment, you're gonna get a general rank ordering of what might be going on. And then there's going to be some further decision-making that needs to take place. And usually not all the information will be at the table. And so a computer will tend to say, you actually need to get more information. Here's what information I think you need to get. But the human now has to go do that. So the relationship, it's, it, it's, it's I, I totally agree with human in the loop, but it's, it's gonna be a symbiotic relationship that will continue to evolve over time. I love that phrasing, the symbiotic relationship. Um, that's perfect. Um, next question is for Dr. Topol. Um, so you gave some beautiful examples of machine learning and AI and genomics in um, uh, cancer and obviously in, in pediatric diseases or rare diseases. There was a question from uh, the audience about where you see the initial implementation of machine learning for genomics in cardiovascular disease. And obviously this could be examples that you've already seen or, or areas that you think are ripe uh, for this. Yeah, I know it's an interesting question, Shannon, because uh, the natural affinity of using genomics has been much more in cancer, rare diseases, not so much in other parts uh, of whether it's neurodegenerative or cardiovascular. Um, I think eventually we'll get there. The problem is that, um, you know, that's where the multi-omics comes into play. We, we you know, these, these tissue-specific signatures whether it's through RNA-seq and the epigenomics and all the others, that's what we need, you know, in order to get a handle on um, the, the heart, the vascular system, and the brain, for example. Whereas what's so easy with cancer, now that we're kind of moving forward in the liquid biopsy space, is we've got, we've got a very easy access, whether it's for the tumor sample, for a biopsy, or through a blood tube of blood. Um, and then with rare disease, you know, we're basically looking at a whole genome sequence uh, to understand that individual's clinical condition. So, you know, there, there certainly uh, is a wealth of knowledge about cardiovascular genomics. Uh, and, um, you know, the, the problem is, though, we aren't nearly as cued in. I, I think over time, uh, particularly in our challenge of this multi-omics, multi-dimensional layers of data, we'll get there. Great answer. Thank you. Um, the next question is for Dr. Mallon. Um, actually, there's a couple related to this, so you might both want to comment. But this one is directed to you first. Um, they're asking about the differences between interpretability and explainability in machine learning, um, and which one, if there is a way to decide that, is more important um, for implementation in the clinical setting. And I will comment that there are several questions related to this thread. Um, yeah, that's a hard question. Um, okay, let's let's take the semantics apart, though. I mean, in, interpretability means that you actually have an understanding of what the machine learning model is doing. 
So the deeper a network, for instance, the more difficult it becomes to determine what the actual function is that's being computed to make the decision. Um, that's different. So, so interpretability just means, can you actually peek inside the box and figure out what is going on? Explainability is a different situation. Explainability means that you have the ability to reason for the human. You can provide intuition into why the system is making the decision that it is doing. Um, the most important, I, I mean, they're both equally important. Um, explainability, the reason why they're not necessarily mutually exclusive is that explainability means that the person who's making a decision at the end of the day has some intuition into why the system made the recommendation that it did. That's not the same as how exactly the function works, right? So you can, for instance, give me a model that says that it's going to give greater precedence to, uh, imagine you're making a diagnostic uh, workup and, and you are reliant upon both genomic information and phenomic information. And the system might come back and say, um, I'm making this particular decision or this recommendation because this region of the genome has the greatest influence on the model that was, that was learned. That's not the same as saying, why specifically or how specifically is that factor influencing the model? It's just known that if you change that variable, it's going to have some type of an influence. So now, so the explanation could be rely on this piece of information, but interpretability is, so what happens if, you know, you don't have the simplest of rule sets? Um, did the system create something that was an extremely complex representation that is not really representative of the way the world works. You know, it, it, it ends up violating Occam's razor, for instance, you know, where you end up with, with um, imagine like a, a 10 layer deep neural network to explain some functionality when in reality a, a one layer or even a two layer would have sufficed, but the computer overtrained and, and kept jumping in layers or you dumped in more layers to try to get like a little bit more accuracy out of the system. So, you know, if you ever want to tweak what the model is actually doing, we're going to have to have interpretability. We're going to have to have the ability to allow what the computer has learned to merge with what a human knows should actually be going on or have an idea of where the system is going wrong to allow it to be tweaked. But you're going to need explainability in order to get people comfortable with the use of the technology. Fantastic. Um, anything you'd like to add, Dr. Tobel? Well, I think the the, the uh, simpler version would be, we'd like to have everything explainable. And what we're starting to see, not so much in genomics, but in other areas, is that using the AI to deconstruct the neural network. So to understand what are the features that it's seeing that the humans are missing or can't, can't grasp. So we're just seeing the beginning of that. And what's interesting about AI is for AI scientists, the answer for every AI problem is an AI solution. Now, the problem we have right now is that um, it isn't clear that we're going to be able to deconstruct and provide explainability for everything that AI can do. But that is what we would like to see. Wouldn't that be nice? And there's some hints that maybe we'll get there. So, um, you know, I think uh, it's interesting to follow this space. It's basically kind of reverse um, engineering the neural network to go backwards and find out what is it. Um, and, uh, you know, there's some pretty good examples on the medical side, not so much uh, yet uh, in genomics. Great, thank you. Um, there's a question that's kind of near and dear to my heart because at the center of it is around how do we nurture innovation? And something that was brought up, uh, definitely, um, Dr. Tobel even put a price tag on it <laughs> in one of your slides was how expensive some of these deep learning models can be to train. And so the, um, an uh, audience member is asking, does this pose a risk to innovation in healthcare, especially if only large companies can afford to train them? And this individual actually is a CSO of a startup who's constantly worried about the cost of these models. So would appreciate your um, thoughts about how we can create a situation in which AI can be used by everyone for innovation and not just the biggest players in the world. Yeah, th this is really a central point. Uh, you know, Brad touched on this, you know, edge versus cloud computing. You know, we wouldn't be in a position to use AI and genomics as one for graphic processing units. So these GPUs basically set the whole deep learning space into high gear. The problem is they're, they're expensive. 
And if you go ahead and buy the hardware, and then you know a few months later, there's a new version. <laughs> And so then you, if you rely on the cloud, that's expensive. And, you know, it's basically my analogy is um, you're, you're, you're renting your house instead of buying the house, you know, which is the right investment. And it, it's a mess. It's a mess because, you know, the, the big chip manufacturers want to keep, you know, coming up with better uh, hardware. And the, and the cloud is expensive um, and it doesn't, all that money you put into that doesn't really get you any ownership. So um, this is a problem. We got, we got guzzlers of GPUs, as I mentioned. Now, how do we get around this? Well, if we keep getting smarter in terms of coming up with, like the, the example I gave with the denoising autoencoder, we got to get less computing time. You know, it's reminiscent of what Google did, where they used uh, G, GPUs to reduce the energy consumption throughout their server farms. We need to do that in genomics. We have to get smarter on computing time and resources so we aren't, we can essentially democratize this because right now, this is a kind of a rich person sport or, or science. It's very uh, computational um, uh, consumptive. And uh, hopefully in the years ahead, you know, we will see the GPUs come down in price. We'll see the cloud come more competitive. We need, we need both of course. But we also have to be using our ingenuity to make this cheap, which it isn't by any means today. No, that's a fantastic point. Um, Dr. Mellon, did you want to add anything to that one? Oh, I could add lots of things. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, Eric's right. Uh, this, there is uh, just, you know, you have decreased. One of the biggest problems we're running into is that we have had rapid decreasing in sequencing technology costs. And at the same time, we've had rapid uptake in the ability to use computational resources to analyze the data. You know, so we, we've gone from something that was like a million dollars to generate a genome down to the point where we're going to like, you know, we're heading towards like a hundred dollars. And, but, but the costs are, you know, the analysis costs are on the order of like 10,000 to a hundred thousand, depending on the size of the study. What, so I, I totally agree that we need to have more efficiency in the computation, but I think what we're seeing, some of the stuff that my group does and other groups do, is create hybrid structures of computation, where you, you, you basically prototype on hardware that you've bought, and so that's like a fixed cost, and then once you're ready to do a, a large study, you then send it out to the cloud and you run it once, right? But you, you test, 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 and it's really about understanding software engineering principles and how to build automated workflow pipelines. And this is, this is something that some groups have become quite adept at, but it's something that we have to continue to train people on. Um, I, I don't think it's quite as simple as just saying that, you know, the technology is gonna get better. It's really just about being smarter about the engineering to some degree. That's a great point. Um, one of the questions that came up, and I think this is really for both of you, is how do we meet the divide between the slow adoption by the FDA of, and they give examples of either polygenic or genomic-based approaches, and, and I think what's really under this question is also the idea of the algorithms, right, that are guiding um, uh, these approaches uh, as clinical tools beyond experimental or research purpose only, and the ability for these to become standard health insurance sanctioned uh, interventions. Ooh. <laughs> okay, Brad, Brad, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> All right. Well, this is one of this is one of my pet peeves, Shannon, is that we have this wealth of knowledge uh, that has been developed in genomics, and it sits in a separate orbit from helping patients and, and people prevent diseases and conditions that they otherwise might be at high risk. So we've tried really hard to implement that uh, at, at Scripps, whereby we're using polygenic risk scores, particularly for heart disease, to help guide whether someone should take a statin, what is their, uh, their overall risk for advising them. And uh, we like to get that so that it's universally available. And as other polygenic risk scores are fully validated, um, that we get to implement those in practice for those people who want the information, not to force it, but you know, for those who want it. Now, most people don't have that. And they're missing out on just you know, years of data and you know, just extraordinary amount of effort so um, I really hope that we will, that's actually fundamental to that project that I outlined that Raquel's leading in our group, which is 
so we can make polygenic risk scores more widely available very inexpensively across the board. You know, there's so many now that are really been studied. Um, I do think it's part of the dream of preventing illness that we talked about for decades and we basically have never actualized. But I actually you think that now that we know so much about common variants that are uh, predictive cumulatively of risk, that we eventually will be able to help people who otherwise would be at risk to, to not have those conditions or at, le at the very least uh, sharpen our ability to manage or, or use medications that you know, select which ones that might be of help. So I'm keen to move forward on this, but uh, unfortunately, when I've talked at some of the uh, genomic conferences, I get confronted with a lot of the uh, my colleagues and uh, esteemed uh, genomicists who think it's not ready. Um, but you know, I, I've seen too many patients feel really helped by this. So I, I, I hope we'll, we'll move in that direction. The only thing I want to add to that is, is that um, there's an economics problem, and it's an unfortunate economics problem, which is that health insurers are slow to adopt new methodologies and new technologies for, for um, reimbursement. And so almost maybe 10, 15 years ago, Vanderbilt started doing um, uh, prospective genot genotyping of patients who are at risk for cardiovascular disease and um, adverse events. And, and I, I don't take credit for this. I give Dan Roden and Josh Peterson and others a lot of credit for this. But, but you know, we, we prospectively genotyped them so that in the event that they actually had some type of uh, uh, an, an, an acute event and then had to go on to warfarin or, or something like, a, like simvastatin, something that was a stat control. Um, we had an idea of how best to tailor the medication to them from the outset. Now, the prospective genotyping was not expensive, but getting insurers to pay for this, this was, this was almost impossible. Um, and even after numerous demonstration projects were run, um, still trying to convince them to pay for that was harder than way hard, still way harder than trying to convince them to pay for whole genome sequencing of a cancer patient when you can know that the return on investment on this on a population-based level is, is the return is there. So, you know, it, it's not that it won't happen or it isn't happening. It's, it's that it, it takes time to get these large industries to really evolve. Um, you know, but you need to continue to do the demonstration projects to prove that, that this is actually worthwhile to them and that it would be a no-brainer for them to, to change the way that they uh, do reimbursements. Oh, really important point. Um, there's a follow-up question. This is a very popular topic in the, um, and, and they're asking both of you about examples of FDA approved algorithms in the genomic space for diagnostics. Ooh. I'm not aware of any that are FDA I'm, approved. Um, I'm not aware of any, any either. Not there yet. Are, there are many now uh, that are cleared through 510K for, you know, images in medicine but not that I'm aware of for genomic um, uh, algorithms. Uh, Brad, I, I, I don't know of any. I, I don't know off the top of my head, so I'm not gonna speak at turn on that. Yeah, I, I do know of a, a really nice paper recently and I'll post it in the chat that actually kind of showed them, but it's exactly as you said, Dr. Tobel, that many of them are not yet, don't have clearance yet. So it's kind of what's in the pipeline. And as, as both of you kind of mentioned, it's a very dominant in what would, I would say is the earlier space, which is imaging, right? So radiology, that type of space. So I'll put that into the chat. Um, uh, Dr. Topol, there was a question for you specifically about the digital twin uh, project. Yeah, yeah. And uh, they're asking to understand the difference between that and TCGA with respect to the data. And then this follow-up question is if it's possible to access uh, the data from Tempest. Yeah, well, we're, we're working on trying to access that data. We haven't cracked into it yet, but we, we're working on it. Um, you know, that's, they've developed an incredible resource, but they haven't tapped into it. Theoretically, uh, it will be of great value. So the point I, just to amplify uh, or extend the comments there, we don't have a good example of, a, of an information infrastructure that would provide for medical digital twins. That is, um, where there's, you know, a wealth, ideally millions or billions of people and matching up for every which way 
to predict uh, the best treatment and outcomes. What we have relied upon until now are clinical trials. But as you well know, and, and even the best of clinical trials, maybe five out of 100 people benefit. So this is a whole new a way to derive um, uh, you know, insight about what would be good for that particular patient. Now, because cancer has so much data, um, that's become nominated as the number one. And of course, the problem we have in cancer is the treatment and outcomes are often uncertain. Um, and uh, you know, they change all the time. <clears throat> so the whole idea, you know, Kai-Fu Li, who's a leading AI scientist uh, in China, and I wrote a nature biotech paper, it takes a planet. Uh, and the reason we wrote that is we should be doing this for all of medicine, not just in cancer. That is, our, it's a way to help each of us in our species. Talk about a, a, a health uh, learning system. I mean, this is the ultimate. So if we had, you know, billions of people with all their data that was through federated AI and homomorphic encryption, which is tools that would keep the data at this place, whether it's the country or the health system without any danger of privacy security breaches, that we could do this. And this is the future. I know it sounds you know, a little zany for some people, some of the listeners uh, here, but um, this is a whole new opportunity. Now, like, like I mentioned, um, it isn't validated, but it makes a whole lot of sense it's simple nearest neighbor analysis. Um, and if you have for each person, if you matched up several other people and you could look at their treatment and outcomes, um, whether it's for cancer or other conditions, it would give you another level of insight, but beyond what we have today, which is based on randomized clinical or prospective trial. That's a great answer. Thank you. And thank you for your insight on that. Um, Dr. Milan, there's a question for you, um, and this goes back to the cloud uh, platform aspect and thinking about um, also the multi-party uh, compute. So many of the cloud platforms are now imposing egress charges when data is moved out of the platform, so to compute for the compute to happen elsewhere. Is that constraint taken into account when designing either distributed or leaner algorithms, and if so, how? Yeah, it is. I mean, basically you have local compute and then you have, so you, you pay for compute and you pay for bandwidth, right? So these are, these are two factors that can be trade off and traded off in an optimization. Um, that, that's not uncommon with federated learning models. Um, and one thing I, I wanted to point out with, with the notion of federated learning is that it's not new. Um, the, the notion of federated learning goes back almost 40, 50 years so, um, I mean, the algorithms that have been designed, they're, you know, they're, there are some new things to them, you know, accounting for new types of statistical imputations and, and, and some distributed regressions. But a lot of the stuff that we're talking about, it really just requires engineering more than any real innovation in the mathematics and algorithms. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Uh, question for both of you, and there's actually a couple of questions, so I'm going to try and synthesize it. Um, this gets at the idea of, I would say, imputation, data augmentation, synthetic data. Um, and there's uh, concerns or just questions about, um, you know, what are going to be the issues in, in terms of either misrepresenting the general population or populations that are underrepresented, also um, about misdiagnosis or poor prediction. So if you both could kind of comment on, you know, and, and these, as you both highlighted, these approaches are really needed because of how data hungry these algorithms are, right? And this also allows us to get around some of the privacy and other issues in terms of data sharing immediately, right? If we have synthetic data. Um, so if we could have your thoughts just on um, how we can kind of balance that so that it's still um, meaningful and useful and, and maybe what you see the limits of the synthetic data as being. I'll, I'll jump on that real quick because um, mm -hmm. it's kind of where we're still doing a lot of research. Um, I, I think the issue with synthetic data is that you really have to understand the population you're trying to represent and you have to understand some type of utility function. And I think Eric provided a, a great example of what you could do with augmentation when you know exactly what it is that you're trying to look for. Um, trying to create synthetic data as like an all comers type of data set is a really challenging thing to do. I don't know if it's even completely possible. Um, it's one of those, those grand challenges, in my opinion, that um, we need to have a better understanding of, of what the fundamental 
things are about people that or, or biological organisms that we're trying to represent in order to be able to generate synthetic data. But, but the thing is, is that if you understood everything about how biology worked, then you wouldn't need to generate synthetic data to, to pass it along. So there's a bit of a chicken or the egg problem here that we're dealing with with synthetic data. Um, I, I do think though that, that we have to think of synthetic data in, in two different ways. One is the privacy issue is one thing. Um, and we should talk about like what types of things we're trying to actually protect against when sharing synthetic data. And what do we think it's actually going to be useful for? What, what are the warranties and what are the, um, what are the, the guarantees that we can offer for it? But this other aspect, this notion of augmentation is not about privacy. It's about filling in the cracks so that a machine learning model doesn't get lost and try to create a framework or, or a model that is not properly representative of the data. Um, and I think that there's a lot of evidence over the last couple of years that this notion of augmentation is really one of the real wonders of, of what's going on in machine learning today because it, it's facilitating breakthroughs in, in imaging informatics as well as genome science and, and, and lots of different areas. Um, but it's still somewhat of a, a new venture. I mean, this is, if, if, if you wanted to create opportunities for graduate students to have dissertations for years to come, like this, this can go in many different directions. Yeah, I would just add, you know, Brad gave such a great uh, uh, perspective on this, you know, both during his talk and just now, he's really so, been so, so thoughtful in advancing this, but we wouldn't need synthetic data if we had, you know, the data sets from billions of people who are diverse. So this is basically a, a default that we've had to move to because we don't have annotated data sets. We have largely European ancestry and genomics still. Uh, we don't have other ancestries adequately or symmetrically represented. So this is a great way to compensate for that. It, it's, and it's working and it's important but it, it, it doesn't substitute for the real deal. Um, so, you know, this is unfortunate. If we could go back 20 years, maybe we would have put more emphasis on this. And this is certainly one of the issues in the All of Us program of a million participants that's got more than half who are of underrepresented minorities. So ultimately, if they all do have genomics and multi-layered data that will have another rich data set that will help be a cross reference for synthetic data set. So, you know, it, it's great. I don't know what we do without synthetic data, but um, it's out of necessity. Absolutely. But it's kind of a follow-up question. So you focused on both of you right now quite eloquently the, the data component, but there was a question from the audience about how do we think about diversity and I'll add fairness when we're thinking about the models themselves and the algorithms. Well, that's not so much a question. <laughs> I think the, 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 how to think about this, I, you know, there's, there's the knowns, there are the, there are the things you know you're missing, and then there are the things you do not know that you're missing. Um, and, and I think one of the problems that we run into is that, um, you know, you can, you can develop risk calculators, so you can develop models that will look good in a population, but until you test it in another population, you will have absolutely no idea if it works. I mean, this is what happened with Framingham. Um, the, uh, but, but you know, there's a calibration problem. So you actually have to ask the question of, do you go for diversity from the outset, or if you can, or do you try and build models and then test it on the diverse population to see if it holds? In, in many respects, you need both. right? But until you actually get the right samples to the table, Right, you, you're kind of stuck in the situation where you develop the model, you test to see if there's any holes, and then you recalibrate and or, or you go and solicit uh, additional individuals accordingly. But that's it's, it's a it's a tricky proposition because you know that there's going to be holes, you just don't necessarily know where they are, and we don't necessarily know what all the factors are that are going to be influencing a model that, that we're dealing with, right? Because it's not just about race, it's not just about ethnicity, it's about, as I was alluding to, like socioeconomic status, it's about lifestyle. And so the more variables that you bring to the table, the more challenging it's going to be to have a single model that is representative of, of all the population. 
Yeah, no, it's a great point. I think there's, you know, also the work now that the number of tools that are out there on a detecting bias and mitigating, but as we've seen with a number of high profile cases, it also depends on the metrics we're using and how we're analyzing it in terms of if we think that, you know, an algorithm actually has been biased or not. So it's very complex, but, but great answer. Thank you. Thanks to both of you. Well, well, but we should, we should be clear that there is a difference between bias and fairness. Absolutely. Right? And, and, Absolutely. and, you know, bias just has to do with, you know, is the data, you know, trending in a certain direction such that it influences the model in a certain way. Fairness is about, you know, even if you recognize bias, can you correct for it so that you don't necessarily discriminate or provide opportunities that, that uh, perpetuate a divide? And, and the challenge there that I think you run into is to some degree, you may have to accept that we're not necessarily going to have the best system for a particular subgroup at the end of the day if we wanna try and bring the system into balance. Now, how to convince people to accept that situation that I don't know, well, or if it has to be accepted. Yeah, I would just add to Brad's point there. I think it is important. It's the humans that are responsible for the bias and the fairness, not the AI. Okay, so it's what we put in as inputs that's biased, and then the lack of fairness is how we apply that without you know the thoughtful work uh, uh, to try to try to prevent lack of fair uh, application. So you know AI gets blamed unfairly. But it's really the I's and O's and not the, the algorithms and the models that are the problem. Yeah, 3,000%. The human context is critical. And I think that we miss that. It's very easy to blame the data or the algorithm um, and, and not recognize our roles in this. And this kind of goes back actually to a comment that both of you have made about the you know, education, training, the practitioners, right? Just as important. I know, Brad, you highlighted the NHGRI effort on that as well, that we have to make sure that, that we have representation across the board. Um, there's a very popular question uh, in the Q&A around the failure of IBM Watson Health. Um, and there, people are asking if this is a prediction or a crystal ball about how long AI will be in the business of diagnosis, diagnostics and healthcare. <laughs> so I, I leave that to both of you, uh, however you'd like to comment. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I've written about this a fair amount. Um, I think uh, what, ha what happened with IBM is they tried to um, say they could do things and they and it was many years before that was possible so when they established the partnership with md anderson for tens of millions of dollars at md anderson to say they could extract unstructured and, and structured text out of electronic health records they couldn't do it there wasn't any way uh, only now are we starting to see that like i mentioned the, the project with radies um so the issue here is that they had the right ideas but they completely hyped it up and they sold it and it, it was a bust. And it was a very important lesson for the AI industry is that you got to have the good, you know, you can't be out there, you know, with, they were blitzing, you know, TV commercials about IBM Watson health. And it, it just, uh, it was uh, a lot of air. It, it wasn't real. And it's unfortunate because it, it, it could really hurt the field. Fortunately, I think what we're seeing now is, a lot of things that they said they could do are actually getting done or starting to get done now. But all of us have to be wary about that because, um, you know, these companies have different interests uh, and we have to know for sure before there's any major investment in something like this, that it really works. Um, so uh, it's unfortunate that we went through that. Um, and I think IBM regrets a lot of what th they did um, and hopefully we'll learn. No, fantastic. We are, I'm getting the nudge that we're almost out of time. This is an amazing discussion, but I do want to put in, there's a couple of threads in here around training and education. And uh, there's one in particular from a resident physician who is thinking about how he can uh, quote unquote, get in the game in terms of this. So do you have any advice for, you know, trainees or actually I would say trainees of any level about if they're interested in, in either learning about this or applying um, advice for them? So this is a question to both of you. I think there's several opportunities. You know, I, I think it depends on what level of, of um, detail somebody wants to go into the field. You know, it's, it's one thing to be knowledgeable. It's another thing to be a tool builder or an analyst. Um, and I think you, you have to recognize where you want to be, first of all. That said, because the reason why I bring that up is that there are there are certainly training programs and tutorials that are more focused on on the mathematics and the informatics itself, 
Um, and so you can you can look for graduate training programs in, in, in that regard or for postdoctoral opportunities. Um, but then there's also um, things like, like the T32 programs that are focused on genomic medicine, where some of it's research, but some of it is really just in the application of genomics in the context of a clinical environment. Um, and so th those types of training opportunities are, are worthwhile for people who want to become practitioners more so than, than general hardcore um, genome scientists. And I would just add, I can't imagine there's a more exciting area to work in, uh, as opposed to the medical side, where it's a lot of regulatory stuff and it moves much slower. This moves so fast, and we're still at the earliest phase, and that's what people should realize. This is just starting to get going, and it has an immense future. So, you know, I think, it, I think it's great to attract as much talent and uh, enthusiasm as we can get in the field. Well, that's a brilliant way to close. I thank you both for your time and expertise. Um, I know that this has been incredible. There's so many questions we didn't answer, um, but thank you both for your presentations today. And uh, just as a reminder to the audience, we're going to take about a 20 minute break and then we'll start up with the next session. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for hosting, Shannon. That was great. Thank you.